This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Today is Martin Luther King Day in the United States. As a follower of Jesus, Dr. King was tireless in his efforts to live a faithful witness in the public square. Today's first episode of Season 6 is dedicated to his memory. Today, we welcome lifelong social activist Dr. Aubrey Hendricks. One of today's foremost commentators on the intersection of religion and political economy in America, Dr. Hendricks is the most widely read and perhaps the most influential African-American biblical scholar writing today. His recent book, Christians Against Christianity, How Right-Wing Evangelicals Are Destroying Our Nation and Our Faith, has gathered wide acclaim. A widely sought lecturer and media spokesperson, Dr. Hendricks' appearance includes CNN, MSNBC, CBS, Fox News, Fox Business News, The Discovery Channel, PBS, BBC, and more. On this day especially, we are honored to learn from this distinguished scholar and visibility rights champion. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be listening. Welcome back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And we welcome you back to a new season. It's season six. Woo-hoo! And again, I'm still Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Anglican Church in London. And I'm Kevin George from St. Aidan's Anglican Church in Northwest London. Uh, where the heck is Ian? We're flying solo today, my friend. Yeah. Ian has some uh, business to take care of, so we're missing him, okay. but he All will right. be back. He okay. will be back. He'll be with us next week. And uh, yeah, this is great. We had a little break over, over Christmas and uh, into the epiphany season now, so we hope everybody is well and, and uh, got through what was one of the craziest weeks before Christmas I've ever oh. experienced with, with the wild. whole Omicron thing that hit us like a ton of bricks, like two yep. or three days before we had to do some scramble. And cause it yep. was just, it was, it was, uh, it was painful in a lot of ways, you know, like yep. emotionally and, and for our faith communities and such. So anyway, we hope everybody's okay now and we're glad you're here and we're, we're get, kicking off season six with a wonderful guest. We've been looking forward to chatting with this gentleman for a while. Um, a scholar and author and sought after speaker, Dr. Aubrey Hendricks is here, and his new book is called Christians Against Christianity, How Right-Wing Evangelicals Are Destroying Our Nation and Our Faith. Timid title, very so, timid. Yeah, title. that's right. He, he should very have really timid. got to the point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll, so we'll talk to Dr. Hendricks in a minute. You're going to love this guy. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we want to acknowledge, of course, that the grounds upon which we uh, record this podcast are the traditional lands of the Anunnaki, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Attawandaran peoples, uh, and are connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Uh, these lands continue to be uh, home to diverse Indigenous peoples, Métis, Inuit, First Nations, whom we recognize as vital contributors to our society and with whom we wish to work towards a better way together and a way of reconciliation um, and a way forward in love. And a big thank you and shout out to our sponsors here on the Vickers Crossing to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated. And hello again to Dave Mullen and the, and the staff at A. Miller George. Dave, we're going to get to that hockey game. All right. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to finally, we've had to cancel again because of this bloody pandemic. COVID. We're going to get there. And, COVID. Uh, Dave, yeah. Thanks for all your support. Yeah, Dave had us going to the game, and then boom, COVID. Boom, shut down. Um, also uh, wanting to thank our uh, sponsor, Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved. Uh, switch your prescriptions and all your needs over to a nice, small, locally owned outfit 
Get away from the big box, folks. You'll love Carol. Thanks mm-hmm. for the support, Carol Basada. And last but certainly not least, to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Thanks to Trisha Listar for all her support and uh, for being part of the Vickers Crossing podcast. Fantastic. And I also want to give a quick shout out, if I could, Kevin, um, to our friends and a few new subscribers at our alma mater um, here on College University. Yes. We were invited there last week to speak to their theology department to talk a bit about our podcast, and we appreciated that invitation, and we know there's a few uh, in the theology department that have subscribed to our podcast, so thank you and welcome, thanks. and thanks to them, and uh, and you can subscribe too, folks. Yes, sir. Make sure you do that. Shout out to Don Davis uh, for uh, bringing us on over there, and yeah, yeah good. get onto our webpage, uh, find the links to all the places where you like to get podcasts, share this with your friends as we continue to build an audience. Mm-hmm. So, Kevin, we're starting a new season. Dr. Hendricks is coming yes. in in just a couple of minutes, but we do have other guests lined yep. up. So yep. it's time for the segment on the Vickers Crossing we like to call. Hey, Kevin, who in the world did you book this week? Well, that's a good question. Drum roll, please. I am very excited to say, uh, very excited. I, is, I can't say how excited I am. One of my favorite things every year. Uh, is CBC uh, Canada reads? I don't know if you follow that or not, but every mm-hmm, year yeah. they, they, you know, there's a short list and a long, yep. there's a long list and then a short list and then they, they eventually get the winner of the Canada reads. Well, I'm very excited to say that we have booked uh, Clayton Thomas Mueller, uh, whose book Life in the City of Dirty Water, which is a memoir, uh, was just long listed this week uh, for uh, the Canada reads uh, program. And uh, I, I have a good feeling about where that's going to go. And we booked him uh, for a date in uh, March. And so we look forward to having Clayton, who is uh, an award-winning filmmaker. Uh, he's called a bioneer, which is a word I hadn't been familiar bioneer. with. Bioneer. Bioneer is people working in, in, uh, in, in, in sustainability, uh, his activism around uh, sustainable energy and pushing back against uh, you know fossil fuels. Uh, his mm. his book is incredible. His work is incredible. His life is incredible, and he's a great person. And we should be very honored to know that he's coming on our podcast. So very excited to have book late. Good. good, good. So we'll look forward to that. Someone else who is incredible, and you're going to find out even more because you're going to be spending some time listening to him. Is Dr. Obrey Hendricks? Uh, oh. He's joining us from uh, Columbia University in New York, and he is coming in. I think right about now. Come on in, Dr. Hendricks. And here he is. We are so happy today to be able to welcome Dr. Obrey Hendricks with us today on the Vickers Crossing podcast. Uh, Dr. Hendricks, I'm going to make an assumption that you're you're in New York right now. Always great to check in with with our I friends am. in New York and welcome. And, and how is everything going for you down there? Well, it's 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 sort of chilly here. And is it? Uh, yeah. You know, but I <clears throat> my students might not like to hear it, but students, are, you know, they've been on hiatus for the holiday. Mm. and so it's been nice <laughs> yeah good, good. Do that. well yeah, you need a little quiet too right yeah, yeah. you can get a seat hurts. in the restaurants now you perfect know. yeah 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 well, perfect. we're in we're we're into non-restaurant dining again now back here we're into yeah. takeout only covid protocols are yeah. ramped back up yeah. and so on but things are still pretty free down there dr hendrix well no not really i mean well you have to <clears throat> it depends where you go but but you're supposed to uh, show your um yeah uh your, your uh, vaccine status yeah yeah and uh yes. you know, many restaurants have put up plastic barriers and but um you know it's still very iffy it's still very yeah iffy. yeah, yeah know what's very much so well yeah, yeah. So, tough times well we're we're thrilled to have you here we want to uh want to talk about your new book today and uh it's called christians against christianity how right-wing evangelicals are destroying our nation and our faith. And a wonderful read. And so we've got some questions for you, and I'll, I'll throw it to Kevin to kind of get things underway. Sure. I just want to know why you went with such a timid title, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. How right-wing Christians are. I just love it. And I was like, let's just get it right out there. Yeah. And, and, uh, I want folks to know what they're getting into. Yeah, when they That's play. right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, at the very outset of this book, you really, I mean, you go right after... Uh, the, the, the heart of the issue, and you decry the state of uh, Christianity in America, particularly as it relates to right-wing Christianity, uh, and you call it a travesty. Uh, you say it's, it's a travesty, a brutal sham, a tragic charade, a cynical deceit, and, uh, and you go on in the first chapter to say, and I'm just going to quote a short section here, you write a curious thing. 
perhaps blasphemy even, that today so many Christians seem to define themselves not by those they love, but by those whom they have no, for whom they have no love. Muslims, gays, immigrants, women who seek to exercise full sovereignty over their bodies, and those who seek succor and asylum in our land from deadening poverty and the threat of deadly violence in their own. These Christians cry bitter tears for the unjust execution of Jesus 2,000 years ago, but have few tears for the injustice visited daily upon those among those for whom, among us, for whom Jesus expressed great love, the desperately poor, the sick, the vulnerable, the refugees struggling to find a better life for the babies at their breasts. Nonetheless, you write, I must admit, even having long been aware of this twisted strand of Christianity in our society, I was still shocked to learn that millions of Christians, particularly the vast majority of right-wing evangelicals, some 81%, who so zealously preach moral restitute and personal piety could actually champion a man like the previous president, uh, the man who shall not be named, <laughs> and, uh, good old Donald. He's out of office now, Dr. Hendricks, but he's not going anywhere. In fact, I suppose you could argue that his supporters seem more emboldened than ever. Um, watching the rallies that have gone on since Donald Trump left office, um, those who overwhelmingly believe the big lie uh, that Biden lost the election and so on are are tend to be these Bible banging Christians. Uh, your book is a clarion call to reclaim the word evangelical, which nowadays seems uh, synonymous with white nationalism. Can you say more about how evangelicals who as a group were once dedicated to championing the poor, the vulnerable, uh, and were in solidarity with the marginalized rather than demonizing them. Um, uh, can you say more about how uh, they've come to champion someone like Trump and how this sort of uh, thinking has, has risen to the floor, I guess. Yeah, no, that's a good, good question. Yes, as, as I, you know, talk about in Christians Against Christianity, um, um, you know, I, I um, rely on, on, on some of the work of Randall, Randall Balmer, who's one of our preeminent evangelical scholars, looking at um, the great work that evangelicals did. You know, as, as you know, most abolitionists were evangelicals. and. Um, many of them championing the rights of women and, uh, and labor. Um, mm -hmm. And some of their, um, uh, some of, of their uh, uh, po well, uh, proposed policies um, <clears throat> would be even um, progressive today, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> that sort of, that, the emphasis waned somewhat. Um, well, I'm going to skip that far. I'm going to go to FDR. Mm -hmm. So when FDR uh, changed the uh, philosophy of government from being laissez-faire and uh, hands-off and, and taking no responsibility for uh, the care of, 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 uh, of the everyday people, the poor people and the vulnerable, and FDR changed that with the, the New Deal, then those in power and control, um, uh, the rich capitalists, um, they, of course, they, they turned on on, on Roosevelt, but they enlisted some evangelicals um, to their cause to help do their dirty work. Mm -hmm. And so we start seeing um, in, in the 30s uh, and, and 40s, right-wing evangelical organizations popping up that are being funded by, by the DuPonts and the, and the rich folk um, to actually militate against the humane policies that were coming out of the New Deal. So. Okay, now we fast forward to the, the 50s um, when, board, when Brown versus Board of Education was passed, um, we start seeing segregationist uh, Christians like Jerry Falwell uh, stepping up and conflating Christianity um, with their segregationist sen sensibilities, right? So when, uh, when Jimmy Carter's administration passed, uh, passed a, a ruling that the IRS passed a ruling that educational institutions that receive federal funding um, will lose their funding if they don't uh, end their segregationist policies. And that pulled segregationist right-wing Christians together um, to start a movement um, to, well, really to support segregation. Yeah. 
And since mm -hmm. that time, though, they claim that uh, that the modern right wing evangelical movement started with um, anti abortion uh, sensibilities right. after Roe v. Wade was passed. That's not true. In fact, uh, Weyrich, even one of their you know major leaders, had admit admitted so. He said no. It was with f fighting uh, to support um, Bob Jones University is, is when we started, not with abortion. Mm -hmm. And supporting Bob Jones University, which, which was um, a rabidly racist yeah. so-called Christian institution, to support them to uh, support racism. And so the roots mm -hmm. of this white nationalist uh, movement that we see today um, started, well, I mean, they're, they are... Uh, they are very much um, in line with, <clears throat> with the roots that go back to Jerry Falwell and the segregationists. You see, mm. so it's a straight line. Yeah, and right. you can see, we shouldn't yeah. be surprised that and they are so racist because they began in very rotten racist uh, soil and they've, and they've grown from that. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's ironic in a way that, you know, they, they, they cast aside uh, a truly faithful evangelical Jimmy Carter oh, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. you know they have no respect for him whatsoever even modern uh, and I mean I, it, it, I, I, I shudder to think I mean is there anybody who's done more post-presidency than Jimmy Carter in terms of exemplifying his faith and exactly. they just they just continue to talk about him as though he's the antichrist because they are ideological Christians they're not principally Christians of, of, of biblical faith, they are about ideology, about their interests, right? And yeah. whatever comports with their mm -hmm. interests, That's they it. will hold up as Christian, even, the, even yeah. the devilish Trump, they'll hold up as, <laughs> as yeah. Christian. And if, and if it doesn't comport with their interests, well, then it doesn't matter how faithful are, it doesn't matter how much right. they love Jesus Christ, no matter how close they are to the, uh, the biblical narrative. No, it's, that it's, doesn't it's, matter. It's almost, it's blasphemous. It, it yeah, really it is. is. Yeah, it's, it's a yeah. blasphemous movement. Yeah, I was taken by your conversation about the Tea Party in the book um, that, you know, during the Obama presidency, that's when we saw the rise of, of the Tea Party. And while it's not a religious movement, you point out that 57% of those in the movement identify as evangelical. And the Tea Party movement was consciously modeled after, of course, the 1773 Boston protests against British import tax. Uh, but you point out that its actions revealed that it was as much, if not more, a protest against uh, President Obama's racial identity. Uh, uh, you, um, uh, political commentator Fareed Zakaria called the protest, you point out, an enraged, utterly obstructionist Manichaean opposition to the Obama presid presidency and against him himself personally. At Tea Party rallies, uh, you write, it was not uncommon to see Obama burned in effigy, hanging from a noose, uh, depicted as an African witch doctor replete with bone in his nose and as a mugger holding Uncle Sam in a chokehold. He was told to go home to Kenya. Uh, even his wife and daughter were subjected to racial slurs and insults. Uh, the air at Tea Party gatherings, you write, was thick with chants of we want our country back and give us our country back as if America had been overrun by a foreign invader. Former Republican price, vice presidential candidate, Sarah Palin epitomized uh, these sentiments with her charge that Obama is not one of us. Black members of Congress were even spat upon and called derisive racial epithets at Tea Party rallies. Uh, you cite Robert P. Jones, uh, who's a friend of the podcast, we like to say, because he was on here, along with uh, Randall Bomber, who you mentioned earlier. Um, but he points out that the root of all this is a fear of white folk, that white supremacy is slipping away. Uh, more than half, 52% of white evangelical respondents to uh, PPRI uh, poll believe that a non-white majority in the U.S., which is projected to occur by 2045, will be very bad for our nation, quote unquote. Can you say more about how much of this current climate is really, I mean, Trump, uh, Trump is, is not, didn't create the problem. He was a product of all this stuff that came, came ahead. But can you say more about this current climate, which is really a, seems to be a visceral and violent reaction to the election of America's first African-American president, a man who better exemplified the values of Christianity than this dude that they've held up as their savior. Um, right. You know, he's never returned in kind what he's received, President Obama. Um, so can you say more about that, about that sort of reaction, that uh, blacklash that, you know? Yeah, well, you know, when you look at, at Obama, um, uh, I mean, one 
you know, can take issue with uh, some of his policies. I, I do, but there's nothing that the man did at all to cause such hate, hatred, uh, mm -hmm. such, such, um, such vile re responses. And it was because um, he's identified an African-American. That's, <laughs> I mean, that's the only, only reason. I mean, he, he, they couldn't find any dirt in his, in his background. He's a family man. Mm -hmm. um, he's a Christian. You know, of course, they use Jeremiah, Jeremiah Wright, Wright against yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, but they took, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a couple little short snippets of some extraordinary sermons. I and mean, if you listen to the full sermons, they're, it's they're amazing. Just, yeah, they, I mean, I've I've seen people move to tears with the yeah. beauty of the sermons. But they use, so, so they use him as a as a black radical against Obama. It's all been about race, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you call, um, uh, when you have members of Congress who referred to the first lady as Michelle and uh, now it's the first lady yeah. and, and uh, uh, you know, they call their daughters you know, whores and I've seen them say, uh, uh, oh, look, Michelle is making monkey sounds to, uh, to her oh, daughters. Yeah. You know, it's all about race. Yeah. And, and, um, and so what, what Trump did, what, well, Trump, you know, is very canny. He's a pimp and he knows and yeah. a con man, he knows how to play on people. He's been doing all his life. Yeah. And he came in and right away, what did he I mean, I mean, he built his career on saying on attacking Obama's uh, race. That's right. Um, and 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 so, you know, when he ran for president, you know, the folks said, well, OK, he's one of us. He hates who we hate. And he gave license to, to, to folk. Uh, to, to bring out the, the worst that they possibly had in them. Um, it's almost like this guy's a metaphysical source of, of evil yeah. <laughs> because mm -hmm. he brings the worst mm -hmm. out in folk and right. he knows how yeah. to do it. Look how he's continuing, but then let's not go down there. Uh, well, that you know, I, but the part that's really sort of um, alarming is that piece right out of the PPRI um, research or polling that this notion that those of us who um, are, are uh, the beneficiaries of white supremacy, people like, like, like me, quite frankly, like th that, that folks who look like me and Rob should be concerned that, you know, in 2045, because it's not going to be much different here in Canada, probably be sooner than 2045, that, that white folks will be a, a minority here, that we should be concerned about that, that that should be uh, a, a, um, in somehow a sign that we'll be worse off if that happens. Um, this this speaks to a structural sort of issue that needs to be addressed, no? Well, yeah, but also, I mean, it has to do with um, if you think that people are inferior yeah. to you, yeah, um, and then and of course you think they will not run things as well as you. Um, yeah. Um, also, I think much of America knows what has been done to African Americans, and um, I think there's a real fear that there's you know, folk are going to try to return it in kind wow. mm -hmm. um and uh and also i think something to keep in mind is that you know this system has never been set up um with the welfare of anyone but white americans in mind from the That's very right. beginning the earliest days mm -hmm. and so the thought of people of color um being in, in a position to make um, many of the determinations of the direction of this country, it's just, it's, it's just unimaginable. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, to, to, to folk, I mean, it's, I have a PhD from Princeton University and I've been a president of a school, I have books published and all that, and still have folk who doubt, you know, my intelligence, they think I'm uh, inferior, <laughs> yeah. you know, to the, you know, to white guys, you know, like the white folks ice is colder or something like that. Yeah, All right. this plays into it. Right. Uh, and it's really frightening. I, I had to tell you, it's really frightening. Yeah, yeah very much so. Very mm. much so. I wanted to get into part of your book and, and the topic of social justice a bit, which you which you highlight. Um, and, and you make the case that it, it's simply just not possible to really fully understand the teachings of Jesus without a real clear understanding of the centrality of social justice that we find in, in the Bible. Um, Jesus was a Jew, and you walk the reader through several parts of the Hebrew Bible that point to the understanding that 
the, you know, the command for believers to engage in social justice is really foundational to the Old Testament. Um, and I just wanted to share a, a short um, paragraph from, from the book about that. You say, it is also foundational to the Christian gospel, permanently woven into the DNA of Jesus, and therefore woven into the DNA of the gospel. In what the gospel of Luke presents is the very first public pronouncement of Jesus' ministry. His choice of words can be seen as a manifesto of sorts, as the first public statement of the core principles of his ministry. And you quote um, Luke chapter 4, um, where Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. An act of responsible concern for social justice would have been very real for Jesus. And, and you highlight that he spoke about poverty and the impoverished really more and, and passionately than any other subject uh, except God. And yet, right-wing evangelicals have pushed back against social justice, that social justice imperative of Jesus. And they've instead chose to elevate uh, to near messianic status, as we just mentioned, you know, that immoral, dishonest functionally non-Christian man as the president of the United States. Can, can you say, and I love that, can you say more about, about the social imperative and really how earlier evangelicals actually embraced the social gospel? Because it was, and we kind of mentioned on it a bit earlier, it was it was heavy for them to, to embrace that. Yeah, they, um, evangelicals did em embrace it. E and even before it was, a, um, we'd call it a social gospel, you know, early evangelicals, as we said before, they were um, they were concerned about what went on in the body politic. You know, they mm. were concerned with with um, public policy and how it impacted impacted folk, not just in, enslavement, but with regard, as I mentioned, gender and and labor and 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 so forth. Um, but the, the the truth of the matter is that, um, as I, as I say in the book. Um, Mishpat, who we translate as justice, is uh, the most often occurring ethical concept in the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. Mishpat, um, justice, the most often occurring ethical concept, over 400 times it occurs, mm -hmm. all right? And then the second most often occurring um, term uh, in the Hebrew Bible and in the Bible um, in, in general is sodakah, or it's translated often as righteousness, mm -hmm. but that misunderstands the, uh, the, common, the common good cultural setting because right, so right, it's, righteousness seems to imply a um, uh, focus on personal piety, mm -hmm. but it really means you know, um, being pious or doing right or doing justice in society and community mm -hmm. and society. And then you, the interesting thing is that these two terms occur, are paired more than any other terms at all in the Bible, mishpat, tzedakah, just, justice, and doing justice in society, more than, in, in, more than any others. And when you look at the two together, what are they saying? Social justice, doing mm -hmm. justice in society. When we're talking about ethical concepts, um, which a lot of Christians don't pay attention to, but this, what this really tells us is that the most often occurring, the most foundational um, ethical concept of the, of the Judeo-Christian tradition is social justice, doing right, doing justice in community and society. And that is what right-wing evangelicals do not want to focus on because um, they, they want to support the status quo mm. um, in all its injustice. And um, and they also fear that folk, if folk work for social justice, it will militate against uh, against what they want. And what they want to do is to to overrun society. They want society to uh, be forced to genuflect at the altar of their <laughs> narrow views, right? Yeah. But if 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 folk look at Jesus and say, Jesus said we must struggle. To make this a just world, then you know all of these charlatans um, mm -hmm. know that they, they'll be they'll be top toppled. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, John MacArthur claims to be a scholar. Um, he could write that scurrilous mm -hmm. letter uh, again and uh, saying that social justice is anti-biblical and be co-signed by 10,000 um, uh, equally ignorant pastors. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but they are so, but they are so wrong. And so the point is, how can they understand the gospel if they don't understand how central social justice, uh, the ethic of social justice is, is to it? And we can say that not because Jesus uses the same terminology, but because he um, holds the tr same tradition That's right. here. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, and, exactly. And so it's it's so it's it's so basic. It's so. And I think if if folk get nothing else out of the book, and I hope that's not all they get out, but if they get nothing else out of the book, I would hope that they would get that. And as you know, I take pains to show. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. To make the case, mm -hmm. uh, so so folk can you know feel can can feel empowered uh, to take the stand with uh, social justice. In a, in a biblical sense. Now, isn't it Brother Cornell West who says justice is what love looks like on the outside? Yeah, and Michael Dyson actually said that first. Oh, okay, uh, okay, yeah. He said mm -hmm. uh, justice, you know, I mean, corn, people attribute it to Cornell, right? Yeah, but yeah. Michael said justice is what love looks like in public. Right, yeah. public, okay, yes, yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, I knew it was something yeah. like that. And I mean, it's such a rich, I, I just don't get how these 10,000 so-called pastors can... Uh, you know, read the the Magnificat, uh, or or this public pronouncement of Jesus in Luke, as you point out, and and push back against uh, the social gospel. I mean, we had Amy, uh, Dr. Amy Jill Levine, on here recently as well, and you know, you can't get away from the fact that Jesus would have been infused with Amos and Jeremiah and Micah, and you know, mm -hmm. like this this was what built uh jesus's public ministry i mean it's he, he 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 when he stepped out he stepped out with that being the foundation of of, of his own yeah. walk and his own faith so i just don't know how they disregard that it, it's mind-boggling really well you know they're like i said they're ideological christians they're able to discard and ignore what does not work for them do you ever hear them quote love your neighbor as yourself no <laughs> no, no of course do they not. use the no, term no, justice no. Do they use the term love do mm. they quote Matthew 25, 31 through 46, as you haven't done this for the least of these, you haven't done it for me. No, because it doesn't fit their selfish <laughs> yeah. paradigm. That's exactly. right. Exactly. Um, coming up in just a couple of minutes, we have a listener question that we're going to throw in. Um, but I got one more just before we get to that, because you, you mentioned how, and I really did enjoy how you unpacked a lot of of that, um, as we were talking about the social justice stuff, but in chapter four of the book, you unpack with with wonderful insight every passage in the Bible that is used to condemn same sex intimacy as a sin, and and you know it's really hard to read that exegesis of these passages that you put together, and um, accept that these you know anti gay conclusions um, about them are really they're very ignorant and they're ill informed, and and. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you make the point here, um, and again, just to quote a short part of that chapter, you write, no matter how one understands this handful of passages, no matter what they believe, nothing gives anyone the right to make gay men and women objects of hatred and ridicule and violence and exclusion. Such mistreatment of anyone, no matter who they might be, violates to its very depths the gospel's call to love and care for one another. That is to say that no one can demonize homosexual people and follow the teachings of Jesus Christ too. The two are mutually exclusive. Mm. Uh, Dr. Henders, can you chat more about this misuse of these verses in the Bible um, by right-wing evangelicals to you know, justify that hate, hateful treatment of our LGBTQ2S community? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, first say that um, a lot of that is a result of, some of it might even be a result of, Innocent misunderstanding. I'll explain what that that means. But mm -hmm. but be that as it may, if you are supposedly a Christian, you know you're supposed to love your neighbor. You know you're not supposed mm -hmm. to hate anybody for who they are. Um, but um, when I say it's it, it, innocent misunderstanding, because so much of 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 what goes on in Christendom is reading the Bible, as you know, totally out of, of historical and cultural context. Right. Right. Um, and so. Um, uh, when we look at uh, the few verses in Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy uh, that that uh, uh, seem to be be saying that 
um, same gender uh, uh, sexual intimacy is a sin, a uh, biblical sin. When we look at it in context, it becomes clear that Moses, what Moses is saying, he's talking, first off, he's talking to the children of Israel there, mm -hmm. right? Um, he's not speaking, this is not something he's saying for all people, mm -hmm. but specifically what he's saying, he's, he's, he's like, for instance, it says that they mentioned that, well, they translate it as cross-dressing. Well, what, he, he wasn't talking about that particularly, he was telling his people that they should not, um, they should not get involved with Canaanite temple uh, religious practices, some of which in, in, uh, include men dressing like women, men even um, castrating themselves so, mm -hmm. um, so, so they can pay homage to, um, to female deities and on down the line. The point I'm making is that all of the, the handful of, of biblical pronouncements that seem to be saying that homosexuality is a biblical sin and that people should be condemned and maybe even killed. When you look at them closely, when you translate the words correctly, when you look at them in cultural context, that includes Paul as well, it becomes clear mm -hmm. that the meaning is not really clear. And, and, and uh, the meaning is ambiguous. Paul's meaning is ambiguous in the few uh, sayings that he says. Some of the words he used that translate as homosexual that we don't know exactly what those words mean. We right, just right, keep right. reading to them. So, my, so what I what I argue there, um, despite the fact that we are supposed to love folk anyway, just because they are. Um, in addition, the Bible doesn't give us license to do anything but that. It's it's mm -hmm. it's conclusions about whether homosexuality is a sin before God. They are much too ambiguous. Like. For instance, and I, I, uh, Solomon, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they say that that's, <laughs> this country, the cities were destroyed because yeah. of homosexuality. The texts never say that mm -hmm. anywhere. Yeah. They say that men wanted to um, gang gang ra rape angels that they thought were were men. They wanted to gang rape them, but what was the sin? Well, you know, uh, um, uh, lay, other places in the Bible say that. The sin was a lack of hospitality, mm -hmm. all right? Um, right. And, and, and those who understand the, the, the history and the culture of the time, one of the greatest sins you could commit was to not give hospitality to a, to a stranger, stranger because it could mean the difference between yeah. life and death, yeah. you see? But because they don't understand, and, and also many of them don't want to understand, right? all right? They, yeah. they, they want to go with, with tradition and demonize folks. So what I tried to show is that, okay, you want to be a homophobe, you want to be hateful, uh, okay, but you can't t t say that the Bible gives you license because it does not um, biblically, theologically, philosophically at all. And I took pains to, to do that. And I tried to kill everything standing, to tell you the truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. No, exactly. Uh, and, uh, and I just, I think it's so important for, for Christians and those in our parishes that we, that we serve to read this stuff and really grasp an understanding of it. Um, you know, because when they get in and we get into these conversations with people who have that other view, we have some things to talk to them about and yeah. about context and about all that. And it's just yeah. incredibly important that we read some of the work that you're doing so that we can we can understand that where we are. I think well, it's I, uh, mm -hmm. I was going to say, I think it's uh, if if the if the best argument you got against uh, or to justify your hatred towards uh, gays and lesbians, uh, transgendered is is biblical, then you've got a pretty weak argument. Yeah, 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 pretty, yeah exactly, pretty exactly, you know. e exactly, because they forget, you know, um, they also said that, you know, uh, Moses, Moses was trying to draw some lines so he could constitute a people with their own religion, right? right. So he also mm -hmm. said, you know, if you work on the Sabbath, you should be killed, yeah. or if you mouth off to your father, right. you know, you should be killed. Yeah. Or my favorite tattoo is the tattoo of the Leviticus piece about homosexuality, but but <laughs> yes. nothing on the tattoo the about getting yeah. tattoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But again, but, these they aren't. It, you know, it's, it has a lot to do with the fact that we don't have a strong tradition of study. No, in that's right. Jews There's a lot have of, it. Yeah. Muslims yeah. have it. 
Yeah. Not us. We yeah, can we'll, listen to some Jack Leg and we know everything. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. It's, if exactly. it's not on Facebook, it didn't happen. Found it anyway, on but, Twitter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Must be right. <laughs> listen, less less of time for our new one of our new segments, uh, which is uh listener questions. And uh so Ian, cue to music. Listener questions. Today we're really excited uh to have with us uh, for our listener question. Irene Moore Davis. Uh, Irene uh, is in Windsor, Ontario, where uh, Dr. Hendricks, myself, and and uh, Rob were priests down in Windsor, Essex, which is just south of Detroit, believe it or not, uh, because it's it's across the river. And I've been there, yes. Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of rich history there. And Irene actually um, is a president of the Essex County Black Historical Society. She's an activist who speaks and writes frequently about diversity, inclusion, and African-Canadian history. Um, she had a recently released book about slavery here in Canada and in Essex County in particular. Um, she doesn't know this yet, but she's, she's, she's going to agree to be a guest on this podcast too. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, but uh, she's one of our most faithful uh, listeners. Um, she also co-hosts a great podcast. Uh, if, if you haven't heard it, it's called all right, W R I T E all right in sin city podcast. And uh, it, it delves into some of the great writers that have come out of Windsor, Detroit area. So excited that she submitted a question. Let's listen to what Irene has to share. Well, hello, and thank you so much for this wonderful book. In the book, you've been very careful to specify that by right-wing evangelicals, you're referring primarily to white evangelicals and not so much to Black or Hispanic evangelicals. Could you briefly touch on why racial or ethnocultural differences have yielded such divergent traditions, practices, and values within evangelicalism? Oh, good question, great, great question. Um, <clears throat> well, I think the greatest difference is that um, um, Afro-Christianity, um, Christianity from people of color has never really been oppositional. It's never been marginalized. It's never been based on, uh, on, on dominating anyone. Um, you know, uh, so-called well, well, mainstream Christian America's white, white, white Christianity. You know, and it um, it uh, sacralized slavery. Um, it's justified, uh, you know, um, um, uh, genocide against Indians, and it's 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 has a history of being oppositional and oppressive at di at different times. When you talk, when we talk about Afro-Christianity, for example, though, that's never been the case mm -hmm. uh, that there's been any, any, any time when there's been any kind of, of uh, substratum or, or, or any, any kind of dimension of, uh, of opposition um, or marginalization. And, and I think that that's, the, um, that's the, great, the, great, the greatest difference that mainstream or white Christianity in America has, um, has oppositional uh, dimensions that have never really left. You know, Robert Jones talks so much mm -hmm. about that the lost cause has never really died, but it, it, but it's never really lived or taken root um, in Afro Christianity, and that's and that's the uh, the biggest difference. And I think that we saw that reflected in a tradition that I, I don't know that I could have done it this way, but when um, the nine uh, Christians were were slaughtered and in Charlotte, uh, mm. uh, uh, was it Charlotte? No, it was um, uh, Charleston, in, isn't it? Charleston, uh, yes, in, yeah. in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and then the families uh, were able to uh, to forgive uh, the murderer right away. I mean, mm. that's I don't know that I I would have done it exactly like that, but mm. that gives it gives a, a dimension of the, the kind of underlying love. Um, and and um, and underlying concern with with uh, having a, a a deeply moral and spiritual relationship um, with the uh, the merciful God that underpins Christian uh, Afro Christianity, which has never really underpinned um, mainstream or white Christianity in the at, to, to to be a part as part of its DNA. Yeah. Well, that that was so good. And she sent three questions so I could pick one. But that, that was so good that, uh, <laughs> that I think she deserved 
at least the second one because I couldn't I couldn't decide not to play it. So how about this? Well, hello, and thank you for this wonderful book. You already one said of the that. Things I really enjoyed about it was the way your statement of credentials included naming and censoring your parents, your grandparents, other family members, members of your church family from your childhood and youth, and all that you learned from them about what Christianity really entails. Why did it feel important to you to share those stories with us? Thank you. That's a good question. Well, two, two reasons. Number one, well, not in the order of, of importance, but um, one reason is that I wanted to establish right up front uh, that I had a right to say what I was saying, that I'm not mm. an outsider. I'm not standing around sniping. I'm an insider. Mm -hmm. um, also, I wanted to uh, establish that I know what the heck I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and how much time I put into it, and as I as I said, you know, you can disagree, but you have to come right. Just saying mm -hmm. that I, I disagree is not enough. Right. You know, I've marshaled yeah. years of work. You know, if you want to, uh, you know, if 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 you want to um, to question or dispute, fine, but you better come correct uh, with information. But secondly, I want to offer a counterpoint to uh, right wing evangelicalism and. And to, to show what, 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 I, um, what I was speaking about a little earlier, um, the underlying, how, how seriously the black church has taken love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. Um, and how, um, again, is not op oppositional. I mean, we weren't even taught to, to hate the Ku Klux Klan. Right. So, um, hmm. you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, to have, maybe have hard feelings, but not, even, not even to, you know, not even to hate them. Um, and and I, I want to show also give folk a sense of the magnificent humanity, uh -huh. um, the strain of, of a magnificent humanity that has run through black Christianity from the beginning. So I talk about my grandparents, neither of whom were, were, were well educated or, 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 or lettered, but they were dignified mm -hmm. and loving and um, my, you know, my family, my, my, my parents taught my sister and I how to be decent human beings and, and Christians. I want to show also how the role that the church has played in, in building up um, Black children that, the, that particularly at the time when I was growing up, the 50s and, and 60s, um, uh, society was essentially saying that we were nobody and nothing. We didn't have a right to be able to, to go to school with whites because we weren't good enough. Well, the, you know, the church, black church with its enveloping love, um, it, uh, it, it, it built up a generation of folk and, and it has built up generations of us who were just hated by this country, yet we still could hold our heads up high with dignity and remember the love of Christ. And so that's the reason. And also, I guess, lastly, to model something different to offer a different model than mainstream Christianity offers um, writ large. Oh, fantastic. And thank you, Irene, for those incredible questions. Her other question actually is one that Rob already asked you, so I don't have to ask you that yet, but uh, she was she was fantastic. Uh, look, just a couple more things we want to touch on from the book. And one of them is immigration um, and right-wing evangelicalism. Uh, and as Irene has pointed out, we're largely talking about white evangelicalism here. You write, because of right-wing evangelicals profess regard for the Bible with ubiquity of admonitions of support uh, to immigrants, uh, one would expect them to be uh, immigrants' greatest champions. Instead, they're among immigrants' greatest foes. Despite their faith claims and support of fidelity to the Bible, the reality is that with few exceptions, right-wing evangelical elites and their followers overwhelmingly support the U.S. government's inhospitable, inhumane treatment of immigrants that is being waged on a monstrous scale. Nearly three-quarters of right-wing evangelicals, 72%, again, work from PPRI, supported the Trump administration's ban against Muslim immigration, more than any other group. They support the wall at the southern border. They've done nothing to stem the tide, uh, the rising tide of hate crimes that we see in the United States, particularly as they're heaped upon uh, Muslim siblings. You offer this blistering and, I believe, very accurate critique. You write, if a definition of evil is harming innocents by design or purposely turning a blind eye to their suffering, then right-wing evangelicals are consciously supporting a system guilty of gross evil committed against children, 
the most innocent of all innocents, <clears throat> and you conclude that chapter with, it is a most monumental failure of Christian imagination not to realize that their Lord and Savior could never countenance such atrocities. Any Christian leader who does not actively oppose the onslaught on humanity as grievous sin against the demands of their faith commit an outrage of unfathomable proportions against the gospel of Jesus Christ and every canon of decency that we know. Amen. Preach. <laughs> this, uh, listen, this, the southern border uh, is a mess, and it continues to be a mess post-Trump presidency. Um, what, what is our response? What's a faithful response to all of this in the face of these very vocal sort of anti-immigration people beyond our outrage and our condemnation, because I think we all agree on this. Um, you know, I'm heartened by people like Shane Claiborne and, and, and uh, 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 Jen Butler and others who are doing incredible work down there, but what is our response? Um, what should be our, our, our yeah. response? Well, yeah. I mean, we have to call out the, um, it's beyond hypocrisy, the blasphemy. Yeah. Um, and the theology of death uh, for what it is. I mean, yeah. we really have to stand up and decry it and, uh, and, and point fingers. And, and we're not seeing the church doing that. I mean, the church should be saying, wait a minute, the Bible says this and you're doing that. You know, this is anti-Christian. You're acting mm -hmm. like anti-Christ. This yeah. is, you know, we have to have a real sense of outrage um, and, and just and point out how hateful and how wrong it is. <clears throat> But we have to do it using the, the biblical text itself because it says so often how we should treat immigrants, mm -hmm. right? Not only should we welcome it, mm -hmm. and I, I try to take pains to, to show that in um, yeah. the biblical texts there, the, the various texts, but um, not only does it say we should welcome them, but it says that we should help them along and support them right. until they're able to, you know, to, to find their own, own way and get a footing in society. Not only that, we, it, you know, the, the text tells us that one of the reasons that tithing was instituted, right, mm -hmm. was to support immigrants until mm -hmm. they're able to get their footing in society. We need mm -hmm. to lift this up, lift this up, and make them respond to it, make them say, well, hell, we don't care if the Bible says, even though, as I quote in the book, most of them say that the Bible has nothing to do with the way they they feel yeah. about immigrants. They yeah, come right yeah, out yeah, and yeah. say it. Yeah. 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 And again, that's why I, I keep hitting on that. These are not biblical Christians. These are ideological Christians whose Christianity is, is determined by what works for them, you know, their, their, their interests in the world. Um, right. They don't give a darn about the biblical text, but we must hold their feet to the fire. Yeah. And I'm so disappointed that the church is so ne churches are so negligent, um, silent that. at best. Like I mean, I just you know, like the, the mainline churches, we should be in outrage and marching like this. It's no. you know, I, I mean, there are pockets of people like the you know uh, uh, Shane Claiborne, Robert yeah. Chow Romero, others who are doing incredible work down at the border. Mm -hmm. But but where where is the Episcopalian church? You know, where is you know? And I realize that you know there are those speaking up. But I guess the, the part I get to is, you know, it, it doesn't, from, from a distance, it doesn't look a whole lot better down there right yet. No, no, you know, I mean, you're right. We see individual churches. We don't see um, almost no denominations that I know of are standing up yeah. um, like, like they should. And, and, and you're right. I mean, uh, um, there should be all kinds of demonstrations. I mean, look, Babies have died, have yeah. been killed, yeah. died yeah. for lack of medicine, and been locked up in cages, have been chained, yeah. literally yeah. chained. Yeah. And our churches aren't saying anything, I mean, really con uh, commensurate with the amount of evil That's that right. we're faced with. And part yeah. of it is that we seem to be so reluctant to call evil what it is that's true what we're seeing is yeah. evil being yeah. um evil that's being perpetrated and pervade in the name of jesus christ in the yeah. name of talk about blasphemy yeah. oh man yeah. it's 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 and that's why you know i, I talk in the epilogue about yeah um, spirit of antichrist 
right, right. Because um, it, this, well, I don't know if you want to talk about that at some point. Oh, no, you go ahead. No, well, you know, the spirit ahead. of Antichrist, as you know, Revelation doesn't say anything about Antichrist. It talks about a beast. It's in the Johannine letters, it talks about uh, Antichrist, Antichrists, plural, and the mm -hmm. spirit of Antichrist. So we're not talking about some metaphysical, um, supernatural um, Antichrist. Anti means in opposition to, right? Against mm -hmm. an Antichrist, Antichrist, mm -hmm. and the spirit mm -hmm. of Antichrist is uh, that which... Um, it is in opposition to the teaching, the gospel teachings, um, but it's perpetrated and pervade in the in the name of those teachings. In other words, they're teaching the teaching the opposite of what Jesus taught in Jesus' name. Yes, that's anti-Christianity, anti-Christ. So we're talking about a movement that is anti that is imbued with a spirit of anti-Christ and anti-Christianity, and we. And, and, and that is evil, and we have to start calling it what it is and realize that we are in a fight against evil. And I think that's one of the reasons we're not seeing as much pushback as we should. This side calls, the other side calls us evil. Yeah. They call us all kinds of names, and, but, they are, but they are really doing evil. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And we're not we're not calling we're not calling evil. We're not calling that, that mm -hmm. jackass that was in the White House yeah. an evil actor. Yeah. Uh, he is an evil, evil man. There's no question about it. And and no. and there's no way in the world that he should not be um Christians should not look at him and uh and reject him outright for what he's done and decrying his evil outright. Instead, they call him their his uh, their messiah. Yeah. Right. Chosen one. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's one, yeah. it's yeah. it's shocking. You know, Miguel De La Torre was on here as well. And he talks about this, too, about the uh, Antichrist nature of, of this. And, and you know, is careful to sort of say, don't think about Timothy, Timothy LaHaye here when I say this, like to, right. like exactly. you pointed out the scholarly part of this. But I I just <laughs> the stakes are very high, too. Right. So, I mean, you know, he's going to run again. Um mm -hmm. And uh, and he does have a, co a coalescing group of, of right wing evangelicals supporting him. And so the stakes are high for those of us who uh, have a different understanding of Christianity, who see, Chris see these scriptures and, and are able to pick up the scholarly work of people like yourself who've put your life into teaching what the Bible says about these things. We The stakes are high. I mean, I'm here in Canada, so it's a different reality, but we're seeing it here as well, Dr. Hendricks. Mm -hmm. it, it, everything over there spills over a little bit. So we've got things like we've got a leader of our conservative end who says, take Canada back, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, instead of make Canada greatest, take Canada back from, from whom exactly, from but it's the same, whom, yeah. it's the same, same shit, different flavor, but <laughs> you know, it's, but, yeah. but, but I mean, I, I just, I think the stakes are so very high that it's, mm. it's really important that people in our pews, in, in our churches across North America understand that, you know, we, we have given to us uh, from our God, a rich, holy, um, really a manifesto of a way to live, to kingdom living. We were promised, uh, my friend John Marsh preached here a while ago. He said, we were promised the kingdom of God. What we got in its place was the church. And then we built a building and stayed in it. Well, the mm -hmm. truth of the matter is, is that if the reign of God we're looking for, then we need to put some skin in the game and we need to be prepared to stand up and speak up and push back because uh, the stakes are very high. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. But we're not, we're not doing that. Um, to any appreciable appreciable degree um at, at all and um you know what's so really frightening about it is that um you know I, I don't get into a whole lot of i don't i think we get overblown using comparisons to hitler and nazism and all that but one thing we need to keep in mind is that the the personality cult of evil mm -hmm. that hitler started um you know 60 years later man it's still going strong and folks yeah. don't realize with trump Trumpism, um, it appeals to the to the most hateful folk in America. Trumpism is 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 uh, it's going to have a very long half life, um, and if we don't fight hard now to contain it, you know, it it can go on and cause havoc and hardship and death for for many years to come. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a source of evil. This Trump is it's. It's hard to be a more evil person than than 
than this guy. Yeah. But he has, I mean, really think about it, to be as destructive and dishonest and uncaring about folk. Um, you know, we're not holding responsible. Uh, look, we talk about, you know, the, um, the, uh, about COVID and, and the economy, economy and all that. If he hadn't lied from the beginning, right. if he hadn't been more concerned about how, about his political um, about how his political prospects look than um, the welfare of Americans, he could have nipped it in the bud, but he yeah. didn't nip it in the bud. And right. now the country is suffering like crazy, like we haven't in many decades. And we're not holding him responsible for his right. selfish evil. And that's right. something we have to do. We have to speak against this right. piece of trash. And, and, and the cost was lives. So hundreds of thousands of people died, you know. Yeah. All kinds right. of blood on his hands and he's not no one's holding responsible at all yeah also tried to overthrow the government of the united states yeah crazy not holding <laughs> that, yeah yeah. Not holding not, yeah well hey dr Hendricks, you've been really generous with your time today we yeah. know you've got a lot going on and we really appreciate you coming and and sharing Amen. this time together and and for our listeners again the book out right now christians against christianity how right-wing evangelicals are destroying our nation and our faith will have a link to that book uh, on our website, thevickerscrossing.com, so our listeners could check that out and uh, get a direct link to pick up the book and, and read that and share it within our, our faith communities as well. So again, Dr. Hendricks, thank you for your time. Thank you for being part of our Vickers Crossing podcast. Oh, thank you, and I, I love what you gentlemen are doing, and and you have all the right people on, <laughs> Gail and all, all and, my uh, buddies, like they're freedom fighters, and so I love awesome. what you're doing. Awesome. And, thank, uh, you. thank you. I look forward to talking to you again, gentlemen. Yeah, we'll have you back for Good. sure. Oh, thank you, Dr. That. Hendricks. Yeah. Wow, that was wonderful, Kevin. That was such Fantastic. a treat to to meet him and uh, to hear him. I, I felt there were a few sermons going on during that interview that, yeah. um, you know, when he starts going and starts preaching, I'm just loving it. So yeah. an incredible book, and we want to commend that to our listeners. So uh, yeah. please pick it up, and thanks to Dr. Hendricks. Yeah, it's an important work, and uh, I think the point that he makes, which is something that we all need to bear in mind, is... Um, you know, our silence will be complicity, right? Like, I mean, if we, mm -hmm. if we don't find a voice to push back against, and I realize that there's a, you know, there's a great American flavor in what you would have heard today as listeners in, in terms of what they're facing there with Donald Trump. But I think that we fool ourselves if we don't uh, see the strains of this running through our own culture here in Canada. Right. Right. And while it's less a threat here, uh, it was not a big threat there 15 years ago either, but mm -hmm. it is now. And, uh, yes, and so I think it's important for us to hear that and to find a voice. And uh, yes, definitely. So, um, you know, we hope that inspired folks listening today to, to continue to do that work. As and a thank you Jesus. to yeah. Irene Moore Davis oh, uh, yeah. for those great yeah. questions. And Irene, we're coming after you to guest on this program. That would be wonderful. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Thanks to our sponsors again, to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated, to Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, and locally loved, and to Molly Made, you can make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Made London today. And uh, Kevin, that wraps up episode one of season six. Good to see you again. We'll have Ian back, we hope, in our studios coming up next time. And uh, again, enjoy the week until we get back together again. I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's in London. And I'm Kevin George from St. Aidan's Anglican Church. We're both hanging out in the Diocese of Huron. And remember, Kevin, to always look both ways. Before you cross the street. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks!